Well, hi, everyone. As Jen mentioned, my name is Ed Lomaten from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. I will be moderating today's session on the impact of implementing novel health IT interventions for cancer screening, diabetes, and childhood illnesses. We are excited to have several wonderful speakers with us today. The format for today's session will be three 20-minute presentations that will be followed by a 30-minute question and answer period. Please feel free to submit questions at any time using the question box on your screen, as was mentioned earlier. As always, we invite you to visit healthit.ahrq.gov for more information about these projects, about this series of teleconferences, and about other exciting health IT-related activities happening at ARC. All right, the next slide, please. Before we get started with our presentations, in order to allow participants to obtain continuing education credits for the session, I'm required to let you know about any potential conflicts of interest. Neither myself as a moderator nor Drs. Ballard, Bragg, Fullerton, or McConaughey have any conflicts of interest to disclose at this time. Dr. Atlas would like to disclose that he is a beneficiary from a royalty arrangement with SRG Technology for the commercialization of the population management system used in his study although no payments have been made to date. With that, let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Stephen Atlas. Dr. Atlas is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Practice-Based Research and Quality Improvement Network in the General Medicine Division at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he's also a practicing primary care physician. He has developed novel patient attribution methodologies to connect patients to physicians and practices within primary care networks. The research he will present today addresses how health information technology can foster population-based, patient-centered preventive cancer screening. Dr. Atlas, thank you. Thanks, Ed, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, today's goals for my presentation, I'll give a brief background on population health management in primary care, and we'll focus on preventive cancer screening as a model. I'll then present a proof of concept study that we did to look at improving breast cancer screening in our uh, local network. And then we will show the results of a demonstration trial uh, for doing comprehensive cancer screening for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening in our network. And then finally, I'll end with some information about how we are implementing this uh, system within our larger uh, healthcare network called uh, Partners Healthcare. So uh, population health management is uh, a new buzzword, and one can say is this something new, but uh, in fact I would argue that it represents just an application of public health principles uh, to the private healthcare system. Those kinds of things include uh, the focus on well-defined populations, focusing on uh, vulnerable groups often that lead to interventions that may occur outside of the traditional healthcare system, so not necessarily during office visits. As part of public health, there's the importance of surveillance for uh, activity, as well as the well-known role for prevention, as well as impact of chronic diseases on patients' health, and finally, the need to assess outcomes of care are all public health principles that we can apply to the private health care system that defines sort of the domains of population health management. So why is population health management uh, a novel or a newer concept? Well, population health is at the heart of the Affordable Care Act, and this includes the activities where it extends insurance coverage to millions of more individuals throughout the United States. The Affordable Care Act also includes new payment models designed to control costs, as well as supporting new ways to deliver high-quality affordable care, such as accountable care organizations. At the same time, there's been dramatic changes in primary care transformation using patient-centered medical home models throughout the U.S. To, that uh, include the importance of managing populations. And finally, there's uh, the HITECH Act 
which has fostered the dissemination of health information technology throughout the country. And uh, meaningful use level two includes the need to perform population health activities. So in terms of cancer prevention, we know that despite well-proven benefits of performing preventive cancer screening, rates among eligible individuals remain suboptimal. We know about shortcomings of existing office-based systems, either information technology reminders or otherwise, that uh, if patients don't show up, if they miss regular follow-up appointments, uh, those types of systems don't work. And in the setting of busy office uh, encounters, screening may be overlooked because of competing demands for limited time. Population-based reminders don't require office visits and may increase the use of such preventive cancer services. Information technology offers a way to automate processes, and increasingly there may be new payment reform to support non-visit-based care through uh, things like the, affordable, the accountable care organizations I previously mentioned. So to investigate this, uh, we performed a study called Mammography Fast Track, and the goal of this was to increase mammography screening rates in our population of women who were overdue for breast cancer screening. And this study was performed in our network between 2007 and 2008, and we followed the results of the study out two more years through 2010. And what this was was a health information technology tool that allowed physicians or practice case managers to review overdue lists of patients and select patients for reminder letters that would be mailed to the patient and provide the patient with information about how to get testing done and where it could be done. We randomized six of our 12 network practices to using the tool, and the other six practices uh, were control groups where usual care was performed, and this included all practices having electronic health records with visit-based reminders. In the six intervention practices, there were almost 4,500 patients, and there were 64 physicians who participated, and of the, excuse me, I should say that six, there were 64 physicians in those practices, and of those, 92% or 59 used the tool during the study period. Those physicians took the following actions. For 64%, they mailed a letter. 12% of the patients they deferred because there was a reason that they knew that the patient did not want to be screened or may have been screened uh, outside of our system. And for 24%, the, pay, the physician took no action on that patient. The physician was notified by getting an email where they could click on a, uh, a link within the email that would then take them to a web page that provided them with their list of patients that were overdue for screening and would provide them the ability to, if they chose to schedule a test, to defer, they could provide a re reason from a drop-down menu for reasons to defer, and if they knew that the patient had been screened elsewhere, they could also document that. If they scrolled over the patient's name, a bubble would come up that would provide them with information that could help them in terms of knowing whether to send a letter. It would provide information on the most recent screening test within the network. If they then actually clicked on the patient's name, they would actually be taken to the patient's electronic health record if they had any information that they wished to look for there. In terms of outcomes, these, this study showed that at one, two, and three years, patients in the intervention group were significantly more likely to complete screening than patients in the control group. We followed the patients over the subsequent two-year period and showed that the effect of the intervention persisted over time so that it wasn't just that patients 
were being screened earlier, but in fact, there were patients that were being screened who otherwise may not have been. So this was a positive effect. With this as background, we then turned towards what we called the top care study, which stood for technology for optimizing population care in resource limited environments. And the principles of the top care study included that now in not just doing breast cancer screening, we are going to do comprehensive screening for breast, cervical, as well as colon cancer, so patients could be overdue for one or multiple tests, depending on their age and gender, that we performed population-based surveillance for all eligible patients seen in all of our practices, that we use, a, again, a non-visit-based IT system that was specifically designed to complement existing work that was done during visit-based or even specialty efforts. So it was an add-on to usual care. We had a population health proof of concept where information technology was designed to support the redesign of care in real world settings, meaning that this was a demonstration project. And specifically, we were interested in assessing what the provider's unique role was, what their unique knowledge could be used as a catalyst for improving care. So in the prior trial, we knew that it worked, but we didn't know whether it was the IT tool itself or how important the provider's role in screening their list was. The key features of the tool are represented here. The tool performed patient identification, meaning that it could identify patients who are overdue for screening. It could attribute patients to specific doctors or practices to assign work. Outreach included automated reminder letters for all patients, but in addition, in the intervention arm, providers could also directly send patients to delegates, patient navigators, or defer screening based upon their knowledge of their own patients. In addition, we also created a central call center for which patients, when they receive letters, if they had tests done outside of our system that we weren't capturing, they could call and report it. The system also performed active surveillance and would track not just completed, but also scheduled tests, as well as uh, survey for outreach activities. There was contact management in that patients would be assigned to practice delegates who could use the tool to either make outgoing or receive incoming calls from patients. And we also created a system of patient navigators for the network who were available for screening patients who we had an algorithm that ran in the background to identify individuals at high risk for not completing screening. The study design was a cluster randomized trial of 18 practice sites in our network that were randomized to either intervention or control groups. And this study was implemented over a one-year period between June of 2011 and June of 2012. Eligibility criteria included women who were uh, 42 to 74, had not had documentation of a previous mammogram in the prior two years, and similarly, similar standard criteria for women overdue for cervical cancer screening. We also excluded individuals who had documentation of prior total hysterectomy. And for colorectal cancer screening, it was both men and women eligible for screening based upon age without any prior colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, CT colonography during an appropriate screening period. The intervention for the control group was something we called auto augmented usual care. And this was a fully automated system that identified all overdue patients and sent them mailed reminders, as in the first study, if they appeared to be overdue for either any of the screening uh, tests. In the intervention group, we used the same augmented system but also included PCP input, so either physicians or population managers use the application to screen their list of overdue patients. And we hypothesized that involving providers would lead to more effective and efficient cancer screening 
based upon applying their knowledge of their, the patient's preferences and potentially outside screening tests. The, this is an example of the provider registry that was used, and it's a newer, a different version than what we had shown previously, but again, identifying patients, there was information about when the patient was next to see the doctor, and then information for each of the three tests about whether they were up to date or whether they were overdue, which was in red. There was a list of actions that could be taken by the doctor by selecting a patient to send a letter, to refer to a secretary, to refer to a navigator. They could say that the patient was not there a patient of theirs, they could defer screening, and the tool also provided information about how many days were remaining, because if after two months, if the patient had no action taken, a letter was automatically sent to the patient. If the patient clicked, for example, on an overdue breast cancer test, they were taken to details about the test. And this included a natural language processing area that found information, any mention of breast cancer mammography from the electronic health record. And if they clicked on that entry, they would be taken to the patient's note where this was mentioned. And in this screen, they could potentially add outside tests that were documented in the record in non-structured fields, or they could also defer patients based on their knowledge of the patient, either temporarily or permanently based upon if, the, for instance, the patient had other significant health issues that made screening inappropriate. Letters that were sent to the, all patients would, were both in Spanish and English and included information about uh, how to get screening depending on what, what they were overdue for. There was information about calling if they were, had screening done elsewhere, and there were separate pages on information about why screening for prevention for these three conditions would be appropriate for that patient. In terms of the active surveillance, the system would identify patients who may be overdue for screening and would send them a letter. And then if the patient did not take action, a delegate would see the patient on their list and could potentially contact them. If can, no action was still taken over a period of time, if the patient was at high risk based on language or other uh, prior criteria, they could be referred to a patient navigator. In the intervention arm, the physician or, uh, or population manager could screen their list of patients, send them a letter, or move them based on their knowledge of the patient to a delegate. For instance, if a patient couldn't read or needed more than just a letter based on their knowledge, they could send a note to their secretary. Or if the person may not speak English, they could send them specifically to a navigator. Each of the different providers in the system would have their own registry. This is an example of the registry for a navigator where it would identify the language spoken. And in fact, we had, dip, we had 10 navigators speaking different languages to navigate individuals. It would also identify whether the referral came from a specific doctor or was generated by our automated algorithm. If the, the, there was also contact management within the system where a provider could actually document information about contacts that could be used by them or others within their group. In terms of the intervention arm, there were 100 physicians in the intervention practices, and 87% of the physicians used the tool. And they reviewed about 50% of overdue patients, so approximately 10,000. They deferred screening based on their knowledge on approximately 20%, and they sent letters to approximately 6,000, and then sent an other patients directly to delegates or a smaller number to navigators. 
Overall, in the intervention group, a total of 12,000 letters were sent, whereas in the control group, which was an automated system, all overdue patients, a total of 16,000 were sent letters. And the difference between these was very statistically significant. In terms of the outcomes, at one year, we looked at the average screening rate among elig all eligible patients during the one-year period. And as you can see here, there was no difference in the rates of screening between the intervention and the control population. So overall, 82% of patients in growth groups were, had completed screening, had an average screening completion rate during the study period. And there were no differences for the three specific screening tests, either breast, cervical, or colorectal cancer screening. We also performed subgroup analyses, and specifically, we looked at among patients who were overdue at, during the study period. We looked at patients based on whether the practice that they were in you, where, uh, were practices where the delegates were actively involved in managing those patients. We hypothesized that if the physician removed patients who were unlikely to be screened, that the delegate lists would have patients who may be more actionable. And in fact, we found in this subgroup analysis that intervention patients were more likely to be screened than non-intervention patients, and that most of this was due to higher rates of breast and predominantly cervical cancer screening. For colorectal cancer screening, even in this subgroup, there were no differences. We also asked providers, survey, we surveyed them about their satisfaction, and we asked them whether they thought the process for managing patients who were overdue improved during the study period. And for intervention patients, excuse me, intervention providers, they were significantly more likely to view that the process improved during the study year, whereas in the control group, there was no change between pre and post intervention. Among intervention providers, we also asked them about whether they spent less time during a clinical session performing cancer screening. And we specifically inquired about whether they spent less than 10 minutes per clinical session and in fact showed that after the intervention, particularly for cervical and colorectal cancer screening, doctors reported that they were more likely to spend less time. So they spent less time during clinical sessions counseling patients about preventive cancer screening. And there was no difference for similar questions for doctors during the control, in the control practices. So in summary, we conclude that involving providers in a visit-independent population health IT system did not increase screening rates compared to a fully automated reminder system. However, we did find that similar rates were achieved with many fewer patient contacts in the intervention practices, so-called how much hassle factor would be involved in getting screening performed. We also showed that among practices where, where delegates were more likely to use the tool to identify and reach out to patients, there were improved screening rates among overdue patients in the intervention practices. And intervention physicians thought that the process for managing cancer screening improved and spent less time doing it during clinic visits. So where do we stand now in our network we, based on these results, we, the network decided to continue to use this system, the top care system, to perform cancer screening. And practices were given the choice of allowing doctors or their designee to review the list or to continue to allow a fully automated system to occur. We added a diabetes registry for identifying individuals overdue for hemoglobin A1C and LDL testing, as well as the ability for, 
providers to refer patients to a diabetes champion if they thought insulin initiation was necessary. We've also created a version two of the top care system that I've described that includes new registries for heart disease, hypertension, as well as performing panel management activities where a provider can go through their list and identify patients who may have moved away or deceased or other information. And this is a, a screenshot of the home page where the ph physician can look at registries to perform interventions for these different conditions. And this system is now the population health IT infrastructure for Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as other hospitals uh, and other networks that are part of the partner's healthcare system, such as the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, we'll pass it to the next provider, the next pr presentation. Thank you, Dr. Atlas. We can go to the next set of slides. We're going to have a panel of uh, three speakers. I'm going to introduce each one of them one at a time. Um, Dr. Cliff Fullerton has been extensively involved with the 650 Physician Health Texas Provider Network, HTPN, where he has served as Chief Quality Officer as well as President of his practice Family and Medical Center at Garland, North Garland. From his work in Health Texas, he moved to the Baylor Healthcare System where he started the Institute of Chronic Disease and Care Redesign and is the Chief Medical Officer for Baylor's 2400 Physician ACO, Baylor Quality Alliance, BQA. Dr. Fulton is now Chief Officer for Population Health and Equity for Baylor Scott and White Health while maintaining his BQA CMO role. Dr. Fullerton has served on the board of HTPN since 1995. He was a board member of the Texas Academy of Family Physicians Foundation from 1997 through 2002. And currently, he is a board member of Predison USA, medical, which does medical missions to Orlando, Honduras, and has a full-time staff in Honduras of 62 people, including health educators, administrative staff, nurses, and physicians. We also have Dr. David Ballard, who is the Chief Quality Officer for Baylor Scott and White Health, formed by the recent merger of Baylor Healthcare System, BHCS, and Scott and White Healthcare. And he's president and founder of the Steep Global Institute. He joined BHCS in 1999 as a senior vice president and its first chief quality officer. Under his leadership, the healthcare system has received many awards for its healthcare quality improvement accomplishments, including the 2010 Medical Group Preeminence Award of the American Medical Group Association and the 2008 National Quality Healthcare Award of the National Quality Forum. Dr. Ballard serves on several editorial boards, including Health Services Research, the Journal of Comparative Effectiveness Research, and the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, for which he serves as a Health Policy Section Editor. He is also a member of the UNC School Public Health Foundation Board, member of the Board of Trustees of the Lawrenceville School, and past member of the Board of Trustees of the Texas Hospital Association. Dr. David Bragg has been the Senior Vice President of Medical Informatics for Health Texas Provider Network since 2007. He also practices medicine with a special interest in preventive medicine at the Family Medical Center at Garland in North Garland, where he has been practicing for over 25 years. In addition to his other roles, Dr. Bragg is also the Medical Director of Clinical Interoperability for the Baylor Scott and White Quality Alliance, where he also serves on the Population Health and Clinical Content Subcommittees. He currently serves as the chairman of, for the Baylor Health Information Exchange Clinical Executive Committee, as a chairman for the Dallas County Medical Society, and as a board member for the North Texas Regional Extension Center. Dr. Bragg enjoys serving his community by participating in Project, Project Access and Friendship House Health Ministries. He has also been extensively involved in medical ministries in remote areas of Honduras over the last 10 years. Welcome to the three of you. Thank you. I believe... Um, Ballard, we turn it to you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with you today. I uh, 
we just wanted to recognize that uh, this work that we've done involves a, a whole lot of other people in addition to myself and Dr. Bragg and Dr. Fullerton. Uh, many collaborators want to particularly identify the work of Dr. Jeff Heron, a statistician in Charlottesville, who's uh, uh, greatly contributed to the, uh, uh, the, the, the work we'll be describing today. Uh, before I get into the details, just, just a, a couple of a quick overview comments. So uh, Baylor Scott and White Health is the organization uh, for which David Cliff and I currently work. Uh, there, there are three Baylors in Texas. There's Baylor University in Waco, there's Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, and there's this Baylor Scott and White Health organization for which we work, which has about 35,000 employees, about $6 billion in annual operating revenues. We're, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, work done prior to the merger within the employed physician group uh, in the uh, what's, what's we refer to as the legacy Baylor healthcare system known as uh, Health Texas, uh, for which Dr. Fullerton's been the uh, uh, chief quality leader and Dr. Bragg has been the leader in informatics. Uh, you know, I, I think the the big picture from our comments today is is what we're going to be sharing with you is the work that we've done in this particular laboratory setting indicates that uh, electronic health record uh, sort of broadly deployed plus some specific diabetes care components, uh, care improvement components uh, firstly improves processes of care that, that we observed, really not much impact on outcomes, and probably the most important part of our, of our time today will be to talk about uh, our recognition of need for better tools to more effectively engage patients and physicians in care improvement. And Dr. Bragg and Fulton will comment on that uh, uh, during their, their comments. So again, the, the topics we're going to cover, the, sort of the first topic, electronic health record deployment. Uh, we, uh, uh, when, when we uh, endeavored to, uh, uh, to uh, deploy uh, the, uh, the electronic health record in the Health Texas environment. We, we were interested in uh, many effects of that, uh, financial effects, uh, clinical effects, also patient safety effects, some work that uh, Dr. Don Kennerly uh, has, has led, also funded by ARC. But uh, today we're, we're going to mainly focus on the, on the clinical effects with respect to diabetes care. So, so we're going to talk about how we actually deployed the electronic health, health record, we're going to talk about some of the specific uh, uh, effects that we've observed related to diabetes care, uh, and, and, and uh, perhaps but most importantly, kind of talk about lessons learned in terms of uh, design for electronic health record functionality in the future. So I, I'm just recognizing here in this slide that uh, there, there were many components to this overall research work, and uh, candidly, we, we, we first packaged it all as one large proposal, and ultimately, uh, the funding from ARC came in the form of, uh, of, of specific uh, uh, subgrants. Uh, and so, the, the first work led by Dr. Neil Fleming related to financial effects. Uh, the, the main paper was published in 2011 in Health Affairs and a follow-up uh, analysis was published in February 2014 in Health Affairs. And, and uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on this topic today, but just to say that, that uh, we, were, we were interested in the effects on, uh, on workflow, on financial performance, uh, and, and then, then we, we wanted to quantify the financial and non-financial cost of health information technology implementation and maintenance uh, and the two papers that I mentioned, the 2011 Health Affairs paper talks about the uh, short-term observations and the 2014 Health Services Research paper talks about the longer-term observations. Again, uh, given our limited time today, I'm not going to talk about those results in detail, but this slide just gives you a sense about some of the uh, data that, that we had that included, for example, first-year cost, about $86,000 per a typical five physician practice cost at the physician level of, of approximately uh, 17,000 uh, with, with the total cost about 232,000 per practice and uh, 47,000 per physician. Again, the, the, the two papers we've published provide a lot more detail uh, pertaining to this. 
So what we're going to uh, focus on today uh, with, with our comments relates to the, uh, the second grant that was funded by ARC related to diabetes processes and outcomes of care. So the, uh, the, 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 the first component of this then relates to the, the assessment of the overall impact of exposure to an electronic health record. Then Dr. Fullerton will describe uh, as part of the second uh, uh, study of interest within the electronic health record uh, uh, implementation, some specific diabetes care improvement functionality and what we observed related to that. So the uh, data sources in, in this were, were uh, quite a, uh, this is quite a large primary care setting with uh, uh, roughly about 14,000 people with diabetes seen in 32 uh, primary care practices. We, uh, we focused on uh, a primary aim uh, uh, to estimate the impact of, of the electronic health record on diabetes outcomes. We use the Health Partners Optimal Diabetes Care Measure, with which you're probably familiar, that involves uh, hemo hemoglobin, cholesterol, blood pressure, not smoking, and documented aspirin use. The uh, secondary aim uh, was to est estimate the uh, impact of this on a specific recommended processes of care, and then a, a, a second, our second uh, secondary aim was to uh, evaluate the uh, impact of a diabetes management form that Dr. Fullerton will discuss in some detail. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Bragg, who, as the uh, uh, leader for uh, medical informatics for Health Texas, uh, uh, led the uh, uh, work related to implementation of electronic health record. And so Dr. Bragg will, will have comments uh, describing the Health Texas environment and uh, the electronic health record uh, uh, implementation strategies and tactics. Uh, Dr. Bragg. All right. Thank you, David. Um, I wanted to give a little bit more background on uh, Health Texas as um, uh, some of this was mentioned. It, it, it was founded in uh, 1994, um, and the, the purpose really was to try and help uh, Baylor uh, to develop a strategy uh, for the ambulatory setting. Um, and intentionally, it was designed so that it would be approximately somewhere around 75% primary care and 25% specialties. Um, currently, today, uh, we have um, approaching 800 practitioners, about 650 physicians, and then a growing strategy, as many folks have, with 134 physician extenders. Um, and you can see additionally we have a number of registered nurses, LVNs, and approximately the model is one-to-one -one on medical assistance uh, per doctor. The, um, at the time of the, um, of the study, the deployment, there were about 450 physicians. So um, you, you can see the reflection of the, the growth over the period of time. Um, we uh, deployed um, GE Centricity um, CPO, which is their legacy version, um, on a single database across 26 primary care practices. Um, and we use multiple criteria for selection of the different groups, um, and some of the criteria that was included but not limited to would be the, uh, the type of practice specialty. We intentionally were focusing on primary care um, with the intent of trying to um, uh, capture the larger database and the uh, larger population of uh, diabetics. Um, we also included the practice readiness and we had uh, tools that we used that I won't go into to help determine the, the readiness um, of a practice. We, we, were, um, we were trying to identify the groups that 
um, that were on board with this process um, and had the technical capabilities, um, as well as the group's social readiness, um, that they had some kind of structure in place that would allow them uh, appropriate decision-making processes. Um, I think it's important to understand that Health Texas, as you can see, we were scattered all across the Dallas-Fort Worth metroplex, um, a large geographic area, and we've got um, uh, multiple specialties that, that really cover pretty much all aspects of uh, health care. Um, the model that Health Texas uses is that we, we are a not-for-profit arm of Baylor Healthcare System, uh, now known as Baylor Scott and Wyatt Health. Um, and we, the physicians, end up uh, paying approximately 50, 50% of the total cost of the EHR. Um, so we do have skin in the game when we're talking about deployment of an EHR. Um, at the time of deployment, there was approximately about 12 hours of training involved for clinicians, uh, including physicians. Um, one thing, um, jumping ahead just a bit, that we learned that was uh, a lesson that we did not require, uh, it was not mandatory training with repercussions, which um, looking back, we would do differently. Uh, but schedules were reduced to about 50% for four weeks, um, but the, we gave the physician the option of um, adding back patients after two weeks if they felt they were ready, which uh, many folks did. So in general, um, that was the uh, deployment strategy, um, focusing on primary care, getting it out to folks that were interested and willing to, um, to begin the process and be involved. And um, with that, I will go ahead and pass it on to Cliff. Thanks, David. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Ballard, you have something? Uh, so, so Cliff, uh, did, did you want me to, uh, I'll, I'll go through the, the end of the uh, Intervention 1 slides and then hand off to you? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll just be brief here. Again, uh, this work is described in detail in, in the two uh, papers that are uh, uh, cited at the end of the presentation. But basically, we, we leveraged uh, the uh, uh, work of the quality committee that Cliff led, which uh, prior to electronic health records being implemented across Health Texas, was using a paper-based process to review uh, medical records to uh, measure and provide feedback to physicians about their diabetes care performance uh, by, by using essentially a, a, a prevalence cohorts of people with diabetes across the entire practice. And we did this every uh, six months uh, for several years. Uh, today in 2014, all of these data are collected uh, electronically without a uh, manual review of either paper-based text or electronic-based based text. But uh, because we had this antecedent database, we were able to uh, uh, establish a baseline for, um, uh, for diabetes uh, processes and outcomes of care prior to the electronic health record deployment. And, and so, again, we use standard definitions, the CMS, CMS uh, claims-based algorithm to define uh, people with diabetes, and, and uh, including this uh, definition of with at least two ambulatory care visits at least seven days apart with a diabetes-related billing code. So, so these patients were at least 40 years old, uh, had, had at least two diabetes-related visits in 2007. They had no pr prior electronic health record or diabetes management form exposure, and, the, and they had at least two visits in uh, follow-up in 2009. So, so this slide here shows the, the basic findings overall with this optimal care bundle uh, one, one can see from the, from the left here, uh, 2005, uh, the, the upper dotted line uh, is the uh, 
uh, of uh, the uh, groups exposed to electronic health records. The lower line are, are people without electronic health record exposure. And you can see that over time, those two lines diverge. So this optimal care bundle uh, uh, increases uh, in performance uh, for for the, uh, uh, the 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 practice sites for that have been exposed to the electronic health record over time, but but importantly, uh, if one looks at the elements of the bundle, there actually was was no significant improvement in glycemic control or in lipid control. Um, so I'll hand this off to Dr. Fullerton, where he'll talk about the 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 second component of this that looked at specific diabetes care functionality in the electronic health record, but, but he'll also comment on, on why he thinks uh, uh, we, we were able to observe improvements in processes of care uh, and, and improvement in blood pressure control, but not improvement in uh, glycemic control or lipid control. Thanks, David. In uh, intervention number uh, two, it included the same population that David uh, just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> But only, only patients that uh, had visits uh, after the uh, electronic health record was implemented. And it compared the, the uh, patients where the physician used the diabetes management form and those who did not use that form. For the physicians who did not use the diabetes management form, which I'll show you here in just a second, uh, typically they used um, their own uh, uh, customized template or they used a more generic tool that we have for collecting the uh, history of the present illness for uh, uh, patients with CAD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or diabetes. So that one generic form uh, was used by a lot of the physicians. The, what you're looking at now is uh, the diabetes management form that came as part of our implementation of GE centricity. Uh, you can see it has four uh, different pages that are part of it, uh, and it, it, it flows through in a way that uh, many uh, physicians found to be uh, time-consuming and cumbersome and not uh, well, uh, uh, well done, but, but physicians did, uh, did use it. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. This uh, slide shows the final uh, dialog box that it has reminders uh, of what this patient is due for. Uh, and you can see uh, that <clears throat> it takes you through uh, not, no blood pressure being recorded uh, all the way through to uh, microalbumin is needed uh, or the patient needs documentation about aspirin usage. But you can kind of see that it doesn't create any kind of automatic uh, uh, prompt or uh, ability to actually do this work. It just gives you the, the static reminder of, of what's needed. Uh, next slide, please. So what we observed that, uh, was that the uh, use of this diabetes management form had a negative impact on optimal care bundle. The five elements that uh, Dr. Ballard mentioned, uh, A1C less than 8, blood pressure less than 130 over 80, LDL less than 100, use of aspirin of 40 or above, and no tobacco use. Uh, it was specifically negative within the uh, effects of LDL, uh, uh, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, and flu vaccines, uh, but positive with some of the processes, prescribing aspirin, uh, checking microalbumin, foot exams, and eye exams. And um, <clears throat> what we uh, uh, felt was the, was the uh, cause of that uh, is that the generic uh, form facilitated a more natural history of the pres present illness uh, a more natural look at barriers the patient was dealing with. Uh, it was much simpler. And of course, the customized form was a form that a physician became very uh, comfortable with as what they, what they preferred. We, um, uh, uh, the uh, aspirin usage increased significantly. We had a, a prompt as part of that that would allow the physician to simply uh, make one click and it added aspirin to the medication list if the patient was uh, taking aspirin. Um, we also were able to see blood pressure um, uh, results much quicker uh, in, in the electronic health record than we were on our, uh, our paper form because of the ability to better document home blood pressure readings or other blood pressure results uh, and the um, uh, prompts that were part of the blood pressure uh, usage. 
However, LDL and hemoglobin A1C um, were results that we got after the office visit. The other three components of the bundle could be managed during that office visit, whereas LDL and A1C were managed after the office visit. Uh, A1C in particular had more barriers to achieving gly uh, glycemic control, and uh, LDL also had more barriers than, than managing blood pressure, as many of the physicians and other clinicians know about the, uh, uh, some of the patient's concerns related to using statin uh, drugs. So an, an electronic health record did not uh, facilitate closing of the, either of the barriers related to uh, glycemic control or LDL uh, management. The, uh, the tool that, that uh, repre is represented in our results uh, in both intervention one and two did have some patient activation uh, tools as a component of that. Uh, I mentioned the ability to identify barriers. Uh, it could be done either in the diabetes management form, which was much more cumbersome, or the much simpler uh, tool that, that, uh, that we created that helped identify those barriers. Uh, there is a patient instruction sheet that was uh, equal, in the, whether you use the, uh, the diabetes management form or uh, other uh, tools for doing um, the diabetes care, which was helpful in, in, in activating patients. And then, of course, uh, a long list of, of handouts that could be printed uh, in the traditional fashion. Uh, since that time, we've had significant improvement in both uh, glycemic control and LDL control, and both of those improvements uh, use tools that did not include uh, our EHR. For hemoglobin A1C and glycemic control, we have added uh, a much tighter partnership with uh, uh, certified diabetes educators. Uh, we actually brought them into our offices to teach CMAs how to start basal insulin. We've also made better use of uh, nurse practitioners with uh, an ex increased diabetes uh, training, uh, which is, uh, has allowed a, a much a better team-based care for glycemic control and had significant improvement there. Uh, for LDL, we've targeted better uh, patient education and uh, also physician education to help deal with, uh, with some of the, uh, of the patient barriers related to that. Because of that, our uh, bundle uh, results now are <clears throat> up to almost 50% uh, from where they were in 2009, uh, and uh, we've had, uh, uh, again, significant uh, improvement. So I'll uh, pass this back to Dr. Bragg uh, to talk about our next uh, steps in patient activation with the use of our portal. Thank you, Cliff. Um, yeah, we're, we do have a, a number of strategies that we're trying to deploy to engage the patient in multiple different ways. I um, wanted to focus primarily um, first on the uh, patient portal strategy. <coughs> the, um, the current state, um, we developed internally our own patient portal uh, about three years ago and um, developed it with um, a limited um, application, the idea being that we wanted to, um, we thought we would develop this ongoing, and as many folks um, in organizations realize over time, the, um, the criteria to meet meaningful use became so onerous that um, it really became impossible unless you're going to become your own IT shop in development and writing software. So um, we um, went uh, with the um, Allscripts product, Follow My Health, it used to be called uh, Jardogs. We, ha we do have Allscripts, um, it used to be Eclipsis, in our um, acute hospital settings. Um, and in, like I mentioned, in uh, GE Centricity in, in Health Texas, um, where the employed physicians are. Um, also of note, in part of our portal strategy is the Baylor Quality Alliance, um, which has approximately 2,800 physicians. And uh, unfortunately, we have 74 different electronic health records uh, represented in those 2,800 physicians. And it is part of our plan to be able to um, 
connect, we, we realize that it's going to be near impossible to achieve a single um, personal health record, but it is our ideal goal to ultimately have one patient and one personal health record. And we have some strategies that are um, being developed to be able to hopefully uh, make that happen. But we're also, um, um, right now, it, it began, um, well, we went live in a, a number of locations, uh, being offered all across all the, uh, the Baylor, the, the North Texas area um, hospital facilities. And um, currently, we have uh, 52,000 uh, records, Health Texas, has about 39,000 of that and 13,000 out of the hospitals. And the way we've set it up um, is that it requires an invitation, and we've um, had 300,000 invitations. We're working in the process of trying to improve the ability to uh, just, just to make it a lot easier for a, a patient to sign up their account at the point of, of care, whether it be in the hospital or in the office setting. Um, our, our plan, as uh, outlined on this diagram, is really bi-directional data flow, um, and that the source of ultimate truth would be the, the patient's health record. Um, the information from the uh, different electronic health records would uh, flow to our um, the uh, DB Motion, which is um, the Health Information Exchange, um, and then also a separate path that goes to Follow My Health, the patient portal, um, that allows the patient to. Um, be more activated, be more engaged, and the follow-up information that we've had from patients has generally been very positive. Um, they appreciate their capability to see the results in a timely manner, um, request and change um, appointments, being able to view their preventive services that are due or overdue, and being able to directly message their physician or their physician's office. And the patients state that they feel more engaged in their care, have a better understanding of their health issues, and have, a, interestingly, a higher level of trust in the doctor's office due to the, the fact that they are um, perceived as being more current state with the technology. So with that, I'll hand it uh, back over to uh, Dr. Ballard. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, so just to uh, wrap up, uh, two uh, papers that uh, we've published uh, on, on this diabetes-specific work, the uh, 2012 paper in uh, Health Services Research, and then more recently a paper, a longer-term follow-up paper in the American Journal of Medical Quality. Uh, I, uh, uh, I look forward to answering questions that you might have. Feel free to contact any of the three of us about uh, any aspects of this work, uh, and we look forward to your questions. I'll uh, hand this off uh, back to you, Ed. Thank you. Thanks to you all, David, Cliff, and David. Um, we're going to go to our, our last um, presentation. And while the slides come up, I'm going to introduce Dr. Kenneth McConaughey. Dr. McConaughey is a pediatrician, clinical epidemiologist, and health services innovator. His current position is professor of pediatrics in the Division of General Pediatrics at the University of Rochester Medical Center. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Cornell University School of Medicine, he completed his pediatric residency and general academic pediatric fellowship at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He also holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Rochester. Experience includes positions as medical director and family physician, Lonis County, Alabama, Health Services Association, while in the National Health Services Corps, and director of pediatric ambulatory programs at the Rochester General Hospital. 
His research has focused in particular on etiology of childhood respiratory illnesses, socioeconomic disparities in childhood morbidity burden, home nursing to replace hospital inpatient care, and telemedicine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. McConaughey. Over to you. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about our 13 plus years of experience with Healthy Access, a health IT care model that I describe as primary care, patient to provider, telemedicine. To give you an idea what I mean by that, here's your nine month old daughter later today when she wakes from nap time at childcare with a temp of 104. Just when you finally found time to focus on that project that's about five months overdue. Fortunately, her child care program has a telemedicine unit where she goes to a Rochester City school where one of our roaming telemed assistants can take a portable telemed unit so that your child's primary care physician sees her within an hour and identifies the problem as an ear infection. She gets pain medication, rate, pain medication right away and her first dose of amoxicillin within an hour. And here she is the next day. This slide further illustrates the workflow and information flow involved in healthy access. Information can be exchanged in real-time interactive mode, that is with video conferencing, or store and forward like email, as determined by parent wishes and provider requirements based on their clinical judgment. Our mission, illustrated by that story, is healthcare when and where you need it by providers you know and trust. I'm going to run through a bunch of numbers that quantify the effectiveness and efficiency of the healthy access model. This will illustrate the methodology used in our evaluation. And then I'll move on to the challenging issue of implementation, specifically barriers and facilitators to implementation in the real world that confronts you when the research is completed and sustainability requires a transition from pools of funding to streams of revenue. In our first clinical initiative, we ventured into childcare in Rochester's inner city. That was kind of an obvious place to start because illness in childcare is a hassle for all parties involved, parents, children, childcare staff, and healthcare providers. Not long ago, hardly a day would go by in our pediatric primary care office when we weren't asked to certify that a child who was obviously well was fit to return to daycare. Sometimes a child had been well for several days already. It just took that long for mom to find time she could take off from work to bring the child in. So this setting was low-hanging fruit. These are results from a cohort study of absence from five city child care centers. Telemedicine was rolled out in staggered fashion among the centers, so we had both concurrent and historical controls as we tracked attendance and reasons for absence over a three-year period. On the y-axis, we have absences due to childcare, I'm, I'm sorry, absences due to illness per 100 child days of registration. As you can see, rates were much less after telemedicine than before it. Rates in winter months after telemed were down to the level that prevailed in summer before telemed. For almost all families using childcare, of course, absence from childcare also means absence from work. Over the past 13 years, Healthy Access has expanded from childcare to focus also on care of acute illness in schools, in a large child development center, and after hours neighborhood access sites. Feasibility, acceptability, effectiveness, and efficiency are well established. In addition to this large reduction in absence due to illness, the most important finding, I think, we can now point to the fact that we've enabled over 14,000 visits. 97% of telemedicine visits are completed. Only 3% are of requests for visits lead to referrals to a higher level of care. 94% of telemed visits are completed. I'm sorry, 94% of parents tell us that were it not for the telemed visit, they would have gone to the ED, an urgent care center, or the office. 93% of parents said that their child's most recent telemed visit allowed them to stay at work saving, on average, four and a half hours of their time. About the same proportion said they would choose childcare with telemedicine over one without it. 
provided from the child's own primary care medical home has completed 83% of visits. Our surveys indicate that parents value this, although not nearly as much as they value the convenience. This model is available at over 70 different schools and child care sites in Rochester. Provider participation and commitment is reflected by the fact that telemed visits have been completed by over 70 different providers from 10 primary care practices. The pediatric primary care practice based in our medical center is committed to provide at least to provide at least 25% of all illness visits by telemedicine. Sorry. Finally, all local payers now reimburse for telemedicine on a fee for service basis, and these payers account for 85% of city children. The 85% includes all local Medicaid managed care plans and local commercial payers. Only the modest proportion of children covered by fee-for-service Medicaid and statewide Medicaid managed care have not paid at office visit rates. The largest local Medicaid managed care plan, Monroe Plan, actually pays a $22 premium beyond regular office visits. And children with telemedicine access from child care or elementary school make 22% fewer ED visits than closely matched counterparts. For children with special health care needs, this reduction has been 50%. This number, 85% of office visits for illness are appropriate for telemedicine, is based on a study in which almost 500 children were seen in our office and, either immediately before or after, also seen by telemedicine. This 85% is the proportion for which the telemed doc was entirely confident in making diagnostic and treatment decisions by telemed alone. Telemed and in-person in decisions were as similar as those for two docs seeing the child in person independently, which is also part of this study. We've estimated also that at least 40% of ED visits are appropriate for our telemedicine model. I like to think that financial self-interest is not the only reason why Rochester area payers pay for this service. It's also the right thing to do from a much broader perspective. Here's what we gain in telemedicine enhanced care from a societal perspective with the relative value representing by the relative size of the value pies, if you will. The usual, with usual care, the child is seen at best four hours after concern arises. That's based on what parents tell us. With the healthy access model, the child is seen almost immediately, and when indicated, the child receives pain medication shortly thereafter, and antibiotic treatment is initiated one to two hours later. Here are the trade-offs and costs from a societal perspective. With usual care, there's office, urgent care, or ED exam room space. There are personnel costs for nurses, and med techs. The parent misses half a day of work. There are transportation costs, including parking and not infrequently an ambulance. And there's payment for the ED visit of about $700 for common pediatric illness episodes in Rochester area EDs. Compare this with the healthy access model where there's little or no cost for patient exam room space. The school is more than happy to provide that space. Provider space and equipment is any relatively quiet space. There's a laptop or, for that matter, a smartphone. There's, a, there's patient end equipment and connectivity. Personnel costs include those for a med tech. We call them telemedicine assistants and a scheduler. There are no transportation or parking costs. The parent misses no work. And payment for the telemed visit is about $75, about one-tenth that of the ED visit. There should be little difference in medication and provider costs, although you could make a case for lower provider costs since provider time required for collecting information is diminished, given that images, lung sounds, and the like are all generally collected prior to telemed involvement. There are several other primary care models in which colleagues in Rochester are having successful experience. I might add that these initiatives also have been funded by AHRQ. For each of these newer models identified, I've indicated in bold 
the predominant mechanisms for family and community benefits. Newer initiatives include pediatric chronic problem care, like with asthma and ADHD management, pediatric dentistry, dental screening and child care in schools, and geriatric illness care in senior living communities. From my perspective, the applications for information technology in primary care are essentially unlimited. For virtually every primary care concern, at some point in the care cycle for acute and chronic problems and for preventive care, there are ways to apply IT across distance that will enhance the value of care. At some point in the care process for any concern, it's advantageous to engage patients at a distance. This should be no surprise because most healthcare is fundamentally a process of information acquisition, interpretation, and exchange. Our experience has revealed several barriers. First, a quote from Lucian Leap related to deeply entrenched care processes. This appeared in Health Affairs in 2007. Healthcare is the only industry where you get paid more for a defective product. Hospitals and doctors receive more income when things go wrong than when they go right. And it works both ways. You get paid less for good care. That's clearly not what we want. Here's a classic example. A doctor does a good job treating patients with asthma, teaching them to manage themselves. And the end result is exactly what we want. Patients have fewer attacks. They're not going to the doctor's office as often. They're not going to the emergency room. And they're not being admitted to the intensive care unit and being intubated. But the net result is that both doctor and the hospital lose money. I'm not saying that this is deliberate, but with fee-for-service incentives, it's hard to break away from existing, deeply entrenched processes. Then there's the human response to uncertainty. Doctors would much rather deal with the devil they do know than the devil they don't know. Then provider scarcity. Physicians have more than enough to do as it is. Taking on something different generally means taking on something that's going to slow you down. And you don't know how long it's going to be until you become efficient again. Experience with electronic medical records has done nothing to dissuade physicians from that view. Next, fee-for-service financing, which leads to productivity measured as units of service, which are largely independent of outcomes important to patients. And finally, there's lack of relevant regulations and lack of established best practices. These go together as well. It's hard for agencies to develop relevant regulations unless professional organizations, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Practice, for example, have agreed that a particular telemedicine model is appropriate for managing a particular clinical situation. One reason that things move so slowly is the fact that many different organizations have the piece of the action in establishing so-called best practices. It's not just professional specialty organizations, it's also provider organizations, payers, lawyers, and on. Here's how I see the challenge of achieving the vast potential that IT offers towards increasing the value of care. We need guidelines, regulations, and cultural shifts to unlock this vast potential. Health concerns along the X or horizontal axis vary across a broad continuum from spare to abundant in the information required for diagnosis and management decisions and for patient engagement. This continuum encompasses both the scope and the quality of information. The health system, represented by the vertical axis, has a vast capacity to acquire information. The various tools or care models offered by the health system also vary across a broad continuum, also from spare to abundant, in the capacity to acquire and exchange this information. Various specific models that fall along this capacity continuum can be identified. They include level one, so-called telephone triage, which, if done well, must also include a high level of patient engagement, affective exchange, including empathy, and knowledge exchange. Level two, video conference only telemedicine, which can be done with a smartphone. Level three is a model like healthy access, which might be called information abundant telemedicine. Then there's level nine, 
of course, there are settings where much more abundant information can be acquired, and the medical center is at the top of the heap. The key point, value is achieved when the tools applied match the requirements of the problem, the value zone, as in this figure. Think about the last time you had a headache. Not all headaches require an MRI or CT scan or a neurologic exam or even a phone call to the doctor. If the information acquired is not sufficient to manage the problem according to best practices, one occurs risk that might have been avoided. That's the area in the lower right-hand part of the, of the figure, avoidable risk. On the other hand, if one uses expensive tools that provide unnecessary information, one occurs, incurs avoidable expense in the upper left-hand area. What can we do to promote optimal primary care operations, that is, operating in what I've just called the value zone? Here's a worthy list of considerations. Organized into integrated practice units. This includes integrating care across different physical locations, types of staff, provider types, and organizational units. With these IPUs focused on value to patients, in order to maintain this focus, we need to measure outcomes that are most meaningful to patients. Porter, Lee, and colleagues, citations will follow. Assert that outcomes should be measured for every episode of care. Only providers and provider organizations working closely with patients can figure out what combination of IT-enabled and in-person care works best for managing a particular type of problem. Insurance organizations alone certainly cannot. But to counteract corporate incentives that might encourage organizations to minimize resource allocation, outcomes that matter to patients must be assessed. Don't think for a minute that in our fee-for-service system, financial incentives don't shape service delivery. Think about this New York Times report. Every day the scorecards went up where they could be seen by all of the hospital's emergency room doctors. Physicians hitting the target to admit at least half of the patients over 65 years old who entered the ED were color-coded green. The names of doctors who were close were yellow. Failing physicians were red. The scorecards, according to one whistleblower unit, were just one of the many ways that this for-profit for hospital chain kept tabs on an internal strategy that regulators and others say was intended to increase admissions regardless of whether a patient needed hospital care and to pressure the doctors who worked at the hospital. Back to facilitators. In that context, it's easy to understand why bundled payment financing and other forms of capitation make sense. With bundled payments for care cycles, you receive full payment for care if and only if you meet quality metrics. Within provider organizations, we need to move to cost-based accounting. Cost-based accounting is opposed, as opposed to accounting focused on charges, how it's always been done in healthcare, is essential to enable the shift to quality-driven systems. That point probably warrants an entire business school lecture. Next is enabling information technologies. These allow care to be integrated over time, to be delivered across distance when possible, and to be expanded across geography so that centers of excellence are not bound by geography. The final item on this list is care guidelines and regulations that enable care or endorse all of the above. These should, be, these should require performance evaluation focused on measures that are meaningful to patients. You cannot shift to a value-driven system unless they are. Finally, this figure from a 2001 manuscript and on transitioning to accountable care summarizes much of what we've learned about implementing health IT. Starting in the right, upper right-hand corner with services with evidence of overutilization, a good example is ED use for minor acute problems. Proceeding counterclockwise to the left, we have conditions affecting many patients. Common acute illness affects every child and every family at least several times each year. Next, low-cost intervention interventions with significant short-term impact. 
relative to what's paid for ED visits, telemed visits can be sustain sustained at a much lower unit cost. Finally, there's willing and able clinical leaders. I close with that, hoping to, prom to prompt a little introspection among you all. Uh, any disruptive innovation needs champions, and health services, uh, both clinical and administrative champions, are prerequisites. Thank you. So thanks, Dr. McConaughey. This is Ed, everyone. Um, and thanks all to all of our presenters. And um, we are getting close to the end of our time, so I'm going to actually move straight into our Q and A's. A, a, a fair number of Q questions have come in through the box, so um, I know we probably won't get to all of them, but I'm going to start with a couple that I think um, may be most easily answered, at least quickly. And I think the, the first question that I'm going to pull from that box is um, it probably goes to Dr. Atlas. And it has to do with whether you controlled for um, patients and families that got reminders through other types of programs, knowing that um, health plans and, and wellness programs often send their own reminders. Dr. Atlas? Um, that's a great question. Um, in our healthcare system, uh, patients can go, uh, in our area, patients can go other places for care. Um, and so, in the real world, um, we don't want to exclude those. And if we, in fact, send patients reminder letters based on faulty information, that's why you get more letters going to um, patients, some of whom don't actually need it. So we did not control for that. The main reason is it's actually very difficult to identify that information. So one advantage of the physician or someone in the practice looking is that a lot of that information can be documented, though it isn't in the structured data fields that feed our data systems that identify whether the patient had a mammogram, for instance, in a partner's facility. Instead, it's in a free text within a note where the patient um, has told the doctor and it's recorded. So the answer is we didn't control for that, and in fact, we didn't think we should control for it though that would necessarily um, uh, diminish our ability to show an impact um, if we're sending letters to individuals who don't, in fact, need it. Great. Thank you very much. Um, before I forget, before I go to the, uh, one other question, I want to um, recognize that there were a lot of questions that had to do with whether these slides and this recording will be available after the presentation. And the answer is yes. So shortly, um, you will see on the chat, on the, sorry, the Q&A box, um, the link to the um, recording that should be available in about two weeks following today. Um, the next question that I can pull out that seems to be maybe relatively uh, more straightforward, um, and it goes to Dr. McConaughey, and it has to do with um, regarding the telemedicine model. And the question is, who administers in, is it stocked in the child, say the child care center, wherever the remote location is? As part of that, were there any legal issues that you overcame in administering those medicines at that location? Um, medication is not stocked at the child care centers, uh, um, except for pain medications. Nothing is med nothing is administered like Tylenol, ibuprofen. Nothing is administered without the parent's permission. Um, all pharmacies, uh, some pharmacies in the Rochester area, will deliver to the child care centers, and so we tend to use those. So in that situation, uh, you know, we complete the telemedicine interaction with the child and family. Uh, we um, uh, you know, fax a prescription to or call the pharmacy, and they deliver within you know a half hour or so, and the child gets the medication right away, uh, probably much sooner than the mom could probably get it uh, to the child. Um, uh, in that situation, you know, there there is written permission that the that the uh, parent provides to allow that. You know, we we went through the uh, you know the medical centers um, lawyers to. Uh, uh, get their blessings on that approach, and it, everyone seemed comfortable with it. Great, thank you. The other, there are also a few set of questions, and I'm, I'm not going to um, pose it to any individual person now. And I, and I wonder 
um, maybe we could um, ask you guys to, re to reflect on that and we can post your, your thoughts when we post a recording. But several questions came in around connectivity to other systems, whether, um, I know Dr. Bragg talked about the portals, but there were questions around, um, you know, we're talking about activating patients in general and connectivity to um, other systems that um, patients may be in control of um, as sort of outputs of your, uh, your system, but also inputs, whether you um, were able to connect to laboratory information systems, for example. So I'm not going to um, ask you guys to, to respond to that now, um, but maybe just sort of prime, prime you and get your ready for, for reflections that we might post on the website later. That brings us to the end of our time. Let me take a couple of moments to first thank to all of our presenters. I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did as well. So much, much thanks to each of you. On your screen now, you see some instructions for those of you who are planning to obtain CME or CNE credit. There are instructions there. Um, please expect an online evaluation to come through email, which you'll have to complete in order to receive your CE certificate. Um, and as I said, the recording will be available in within two weeks. And I hope everyone had a great, um, great time. I sure did. And we will see you next time. Thanks very much.